onto my mukbang. Hey Kim. What? You know your last name goes with mukbang? Yeah. Well, welcome to my muk trunk. See what I did there? My last name is Trong. It runs with mukbang. It's perfect. We're going to be talking about a wonderful, amazing woman. She revolutionized American dining. She is basically a genius. We are talking about Joyce Chen. Um, and the reason we are is because I wanted to wrap up AAPI Heritage Month and I feel like she would be a perfect way. She's an Asian American and she has a lot to do with dining history in America. So let's get started. So for the mug trunk today, I have Gina since this is my first video. I'm a little bit nervous. Having her here will make me hopefully seem a little less nervous. So what we're eating today is my mom made some egg rolls. These are her special egg rolls. They're phenomenal. We also have pot stickers and lo mein with chicken. Also, uh, mushu pork and hot and sour soup. All of this is very relevant to Joyce Chen. So let's dig in. Thank you. So what are you gonna eat first? Lo mein. Lo mein. Oh, and we do have our sauces here as well. Here, poison sauce and soy sauce, as well as sweet chili sauce, the only sauce you really need for egg rolls. The superior sauce for egg rolls. The superior sauce. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. You know, I'm not usually a fan of Chinese takeout, but I feel like this hits differently. This place really caters to almost every Asian event I have ever been to. I don't know if I can say that, but they have, like mostly weddings and stuff. They're so good. So good. Mm. Mm -hmm. So good. Mm. Can't go wrong with the nose. Cannot. I was expecting it to be a little bit more salty, but mm -hmm. this is perfect. This is so good. Mm -hmm. And bouncy. <laughs> the noodles are bouncy. <laughs> the noodles are bouncy. I think I'm going to try the mushy pork. Mm -hmm. So what's weird about this restaurant is for some reason they gave us tortillas. I'm not complaining. It's kind of weird, but no, I'm not complaining. It works. It works. I'm so happy right now. First time having mushu pork. Really? Good. Mm. Same. Honestly, same. Mm. You really good with the noodles? Mm -hmm. Mm. 
So we have a dish similar. <coughs> Excuse me, a little spicy. <coughs> we have a dish similar in Vietnamese called. Um, what is it called? Not Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> um, called Pantul. And it's basically the same thing. Um, I mean, it's kind of different. It's more of a seafood dish, so you, you know, there's fish instead of like chicken and pork. Are you trying to posture it up? Mm -hmm. No. I think I'm going to try that next. While you do that, I'm going to open up the soy sauce. I think I'm going to dip it in there. Hot sour chicken in my bowl. Tell me how that is. Mmm, that's good. Let's see. Mm -hmm. It is good. I think we waited too long because it's not as crispy. As for my first, when we first got it. The vegetables are nice and crisp and fresh. Mm, the vegetables are good. So I'm a double dipper, I'm sorry. and she was born into a pretty predominant family. Her dad was a government official, I believe. No, no, he was a railroad administrator and also a city executive. So she was pretty well off. You know, they made, they were well enough, well off enough to have their own chef, which is really nice. You know, that bougie life. I wish I had that bougie life, but Me too. sadly I don't. <laughs> Growing up, she would watch she would kind of watch him cook, but like really it wasn't her place. Um, a few years later, he left the family in order to work for their family friend. Um, this guy was going to be the future Chinese ambassador to Russia. So, I mean, I don't blame him for leaving them to work for this uh, higher up guy. I mean, a pay raise too. Right? Um, no hard feelings or anything because this guy was a family friend. But ever since then, um, Joyce's mom and also her governess would cook meals, so I learned, I didn't know what this was, but a governess is basically like a live-in private teacher, so her own tutor basically, living at their oh. house. Yeah, right? Live-in teacher. Fancy. I'm telling you, they were, they were well off. Um, but yeah, so from then she would watch her mother and her governess cook meals and she kind of like learned a few things here and there. I mean. You know, she would get interested as much as any kid would cooking. And it's not like really she really had the need to cook, but you know, it still sparked an interest in her. I think I'm gonna have an egg roll, actually. Listen to that crunch. Perfect angles. So my mom makes these egg rolls special in that she has like pork in there, noodles and carrots and other vegetables, but she also has a secret ingredient. She told me not to tell you guys, so you guys don't have to guess what it is. But good, regardless of not knowing what it is. Secret ingredient is magic. Magic. <laughs> You know, food makes me really happy. <laughs> food makes me so happy. Like, if you're feeling sad or anything, just eat. That's it. Any 
any type of comfort food mm -hmm. or something. I heard that actually the reason that food makes you happy is because our stomach or our gut produces serotonin, which is basically a happy hormone. So like when we stimulate it by eating, it releases all these like happy hormones. So. In 1943, um, she got married to a man named Thomas, and then a year after, she had a baby boy. And then in 1948, she had a baby girl. All this while still working as an insurance broker in China, which was really great. Um, you know, back then, it was really rare for a woman to have a job, even more rare for her to be an insurance broker, even now. Today, like, you barely see any, like, insurance brokers, or I haven't seen any. But yeah, so she was making moves back then, you know, getting that money. In 1948, a year after her daughter was born, stuff just starts hitting the fan. This is when the Communist Party started, like, kind of taking over the country. And her family were like, mm, nope, we don't believe in all this, we need to get out of here, that's going to ruin our lives. And like, debatably, it did ruin a lot of lives. So they're like, we got to get out of here, we can go anywhere, just not stay here. So that's what they did. They traveled to Shanghai. And they almost didn't make it out, so when they got to Shanghai, they boarded the second to last boat out of Shanghai before the ports closed. So literally, it was their boat, and then another boat, and then the government shut down the port. So you couldn't get out of the country, and you definitely can't get in. They landed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in which they kind of like started their life. Her husband worked as a fine arts importer. Well, she stayed at home and tended to the kids, so she was basically a house, what they call a housewife. I don't like that term, but she was a housewife nonetheless. In 1952, she gave birth to her final child, Stephen. So Joyce's family was pretty well off in Massachusetts, her, uh, Massachusetts? Massachusetts. I never could say that state. Her family was pretty well off. Um, her kids attended this school called the Buckingham School in Cambridge, which sounds super fancy. I don't know, like, when I read that, I was like, did they, did they suddenly transport to England? I don't know. Anyways, it's a really prestigious school. And you know how they, you know, schools do fundraisers? Um, to raise money or whatever. For me, they always gave me this pamphlet in which I had to go like door to door and selling people love stuff from these pamphlets, whether that be candy or like magazine subscriptions. And I had to sell like 15,000 items just to get like a, a jump rope. Yeah. Um, it was not like this for them. So they had like bake sales and food drives and all that to raise money for the school. And what Joyce did was she would make cookies, like pumpkin cookies and egg rolls, which kind of like reminded me of my mom as well, like literally my mom, like at any kind of special event we go to, whether it be like a potluck or just like a dinner with friends, she would always bring her egg rolls, literally her most requested items. These cookies and egg rolls were such a hot commodity. Um, it was said that within the first hour of her bringing the food, it would sell out and the faculty literally begged her to make more but obviously she can't because it takes a lot of time and whatnot. She did do it for future fundraisers, um, but yeah. So this was when she was like, oh, like my food tastes good. I can do something with this food. Mm. I like the smokiness of the mushu pork. It tastes like... Mm -hmm. I don't know what it reminds me of, it's definitely smoky. I feel like these two go really well together. For sure. Like this could be like the side and this could be like the topping on the side. It has like the vegetables and the pork. So in 
1958, Joyce Chen opened up her first restaurant called the Joyce Chen Restaurant, and this is where the magic happens. So like any other restaurant, you know, you have your, your days where you have a whole bunch of business and days where you don't have a lot of business. You know, working at a restaurant, you should, you know yeah. about this. <laughs> so, she noticed that on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, you know, were her emptiest, I guess, emptiest times, which makes sense, you know, weekdays, a lot of people want to come in. But she had a problem with this because, like, you know, on these empty days, she's not making money. She needs to make money to support her kids. What can I do to bring in more customers so I can make more money, essentially? Her, being the genius that she was, she would take all of these dishes, all of her dishes, and kind of just like get, give them, not give them out, but like set them, you know, for her customers to eat. In trays. In trays. Basically, she would put out all these dishes and her customers would come and pay, pay a flat rate and basically just, you know, get a little bit of this dish, get a little bit of that dish, maybe some of that dish, and Voila! She created basically the first all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet. Like, where would we be without her? I love Chinese buffets. Same. Like, literally, that was our go-to when I was a child. My dad, I would always ask my dad, hey, dad, where do you want to go to eat? Buffet. That would be our special treat growing up. Right, right. Hey, we've been do I've been, you've been doing good. You've been getting good grades. Buffet. Uh, buffet. <laughs> buffet. <laughs> And what was really cool was that, you know, back then, Chinese food was getting introduced to America, so not a lot of people were very receptive of it. But this way, you know, people could try her dishes. Some of these dishes weren't even on the menu. They would try them at their own pace, and if they liked it, they would get more. If they didn't, they wouldn't get any more. Thank you, George Chen. You are a hero. She was noticing that her American patrons, you know, there was a little bit of a language barrier. A lot of these dishes, most of these dishes, were Chinese dishes. So, can you imagine saying something if you don't speak Chinese, these, you know, ordering these Chinese dishes? It would literally sound like you were saying something else. And that's where the confusion started. So, people would order something and they would get something like they weren't expecting because maybe they said the name wrong. So, Joyce had to figure a way to like basically fix this problem and guess how she fixed it? Nicknames? No? No. I don't know. So she would put numbers by the dishes. So instead of saying the name of the dish, they you know basically be like, hey, can I have number one? Which is like she came up with this. Something so simple and something that we use or every restaurant uses now yeah. was made by her. So through this restaurant, she popularized items like the pecking duck, the mushu fork, and pot stickers. So interesting enough, she did rename the pot stickers. She called them pecking raviolis, or ras, which I guess is a common term used internationally. I've never used it. I've never even heard it until I was researching about her. But she called them ravs. So I think now I'm going to start calling them ravs and see if anyone knows what I'm talking about. Me too. <laughs> Can I have some ravs, please? <laughs> Sounds crazy, right? Some ravs. <laughs> so she was basically a restaurant tycoon. She opened up a total of four restaurants in the Massachusetts area. And all of them, unfortunately, closed. But they were successful in the times they were opened. Her second restaurant which she opened in 1967, was called the George Chen Small Eating Place, very appropriately named. So this restaurant only seated 60 people, but she had huge lines going out the wazoo, like literally every day. And I think she can credit to this because she introduced a new style of eating. So what she did was she introduced um, the American people to dim sum.
And if anyone doesn't know, dim sum is basically um, you have the servers who would go around in carts and have these little small dishes and present them to you while you're going around just presenting these small dishes. And if you wanted them, you asked for it and they would just mark what you got and then you would pay for it at the end. Tiny. You're right. <laughs> yeah, they tally it off on your paper and then at the end they like count it up. It's so cool. It's genius. Um, anyway, so uh, this would have to be my favorite way of dining, especially at a Chinese restaurant. Um, I remember when I was a kid, or I mean now, like my cousins and I would always, every Thanksgiving, would go to eat dim sum at this great place. It's unfortunately closed now, but we would have it every Thanksgiving. It was so special, and just dim sum has a very special place in my heart. Let's see how many times I can say special in this video. <laughs> So one of the most popular dishes in her dim sum place was soup dumplings, and I don't know about you, but that's my favorite kind of dumpling. Mm -hmm. Like, like how do you do it? You have dumplings, but it's literally just soup inside the dumplings. So much flavor, and it doesn't break until you chew it, of course. But like, where would we be? How can I? How much can I say this? But where would we be without Joyce Chen? We would not the magic of soup dumplings. Like. Just the cultural aspect of it, she revolutionized everything. So, going back to her being a tycoon, she did it all. She held cooking classes, you know, just to teach people how to make these awesome, you know, Chinese dishes. Sometimes she would have to like cater to her American patrons and like substitute ingredients in which um, you know America doesn't have, um, as opposed to China. But she would she would make it work. She also came out with a cookbook. She had her own cooking channel, mm -hmm. and fun fact: she patented the patented patented <laughs> patented, <laughs> patented <laughs> the wok. So that big pan that you see, you know, that's not a pot, but like a huge bowl. So like the cooking bowl. She did that. Like she brought that to America, and I would not have that in my kitchen if it wasn't for her. Exactly. During, you know, the 1980s um, is when she retired, but her, being her, being the awesome lady that she is, like, I'm not ready to not do anything <laughs> yet. So, she would take these sauces and put them in bottles, like hoisin sauce, soy sauce, duck sauce, you name it. She would put these in bottles, go to the local supermarket and sell them. Sauces, this is her. The concept, her. <laughs> um, unfortunately, in 1994, she did succumb to dementia and Alzheimer's, and she passed away, but her legacy lives on forever. Through all this beautiful food. Through all this beautiful food. Again, I can't say this enough, but where would we be without Joyce Chen? <laughs> Thank you, Joyce Chen, for all that you've done. Without you, we wouldn't have all these wonderful food options. Um, so. We're going to go ahead and finish this video off with a fortune cookie. It's going to be hard to open. <laughs> what does yours say? I don't know. The longest journey is a journey inwards. Oh, that's deep. You gotta go Literally. Deep inside. <laughs> Deep inside. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Take that luxury away. What you spent will get payback. What? Take that luxury away. What you spent will get payback. Literally what it says. <laughs> I don't understand that one. You know, fortunes be fortunes. Fortunes be strange sometimes. Thank you for spending time with us, uh, and if there's anything you think that I need to improve on, or any suggestions that um, you might have, all criticism is greatly appreciated. Comment below on who you want to hear about next week, and have a wonderful insert time of day here, mm -hmm. and, I'll see, and we'll see you next week. Bye! Bye!